Hi, my name is Rob Havers, the president of the George C. Marshall Foundation, located here on the post of the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. And I'm here today for this inaugural Marshall moment with Dr. David Hine, Professor Emeritus at Hood College in Maryland and a senior research fellow at the George C. Marshall Foundation. You're the author of several articles about George C. Marshall, uh, articles that convey a little bit of the man behind the offices. Um, perhaps you could start by telling us what it is about George C. Marshall, soldier, statesman, that you most admire. Well, what I really admire about Marshall, uh, and I kind of envy this, in a way, is that he was so well-grounded. He had a kind of uh, moral gyroscope inside of him that worked all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So he was utterly reliable, utterly trustworthy. You look at other people at that time who did a lot of great things, such as Harry Truman, but when Truman gets up, for example, when he gives the, Mar the um, address announcing the Truman Doctrine in March of 1947, people said he didn't hit quite the right note. He was giving a kind of universal solution to a particular problem. But people said that one of the reasons that the Marshall Plan was so successful was that Marshall was so steady. He was a steady, guiding hand on the tiller. And if you compare him to someone like MacArthur, for example, I mean, it's hard sometimes to see whether where MacArthur is being MacArthur the real man and where MacArthur is playing MacArthur the war hero is sort of taking over. And you never get that sense at all with George C. Marshall. And I've asked myself um, why that is, you know, what accounts for that outstanding grounding of his. And I keep coming back to a very minor incident. I saw a letter that he wrote, that he sent off toward the end of his life, where he was asked to be on the chapter of the Washington National Cathedral, and the chapter is like the vestry or the board of trustees, and Pershing had died, and they were inviting him to take the place of Pershing, and Marshall wrote back and said, no, I'm sorry, I decline. My spiritual life is confined to St. James Episcopal Church, Leesburg, Virginia. And you just get that sense with Marshall over and over. He's, to me, and to my way of thinking, he's a kind of Burkean who treasures the, the small platoons of life, uh, family, neighborhood, his own little church, and so on. And he takes on these dramatic, large jobs, Secretary of Defense, State, Army Chief of Staff, because he's trying to preserve the ordinary, everyday, American way of life for people. And that's what it really comes down to. I think you just find him very centered and grounded, grounded without a chip on his shoulder, and uh, just a great American hero. That, that's a very good and a very full answer. We often get asked at the George C. Marshall Foundation, where are our marshals today? Where are those leaders of that substance and that standing? And we tend to imagine on occasion that Marshall is one of very many great leaders from a, a great time in an American history, indeed world history. It's worth remembering, and you've underscored that point, that even in his time, Marshall is very much the um, exception to the rule. And what you've just eliminated really underscores that fact quite substantially. Why do you think it is important that George C. Marshall, his legacy, the memory of what he did, is remembered today in the 21st century? Well, that's a good question. I would say for just two reasons, style and substance. In regard to style, you look at people today, I was reading an article by Daniel Henninger earlier today, and it talked about the celebrification of the presidency in both Obama and Trump. Uh, in the case of both of them, is I, I, I. Um, and maybe social media has something to do with that, but I guarantee you that if social media had been around in Marshall's time, he still would not have allowed himself to be celebrified. Um, when Marshall said to the people working with him, that I want you to know that I reserve my emotions for my wife. Marshall didn't mean I have no feelings. He meant, I want you to deal with these problems that we're confronted with in a cold, analytical, rational, tough-minded way. We've got serious problems to deal with. It wasn't full of emotion. It wasn't full of drama. He just wanted to get to the goal line, which was coming up with the best possible solution to these problems. So I think that his style, in a sense, if you said to George C. Marshall, what is your personal style, General? He would say, what kind of a question is that? I don't care what my personal style is. I care about getting the job done. And so people viewed him as objective, as real, as focused, as trustworthy, and utterly reliable, as I mentioned before. Now, with regard to substance, that's something where I think that a lot of people 
need a fuller understanding of Marshall. It really takes years of looking at him to get a sense of that. I would say that Marshall was a conservative internationalist, and he's best understood as a conservative internationalist. He's not usually viewed that way, but I think he should be. On the conservative side, he was a realist. He understood the uses of American power. He didn't put over-reliance in great international institutions like the United Nations. He realized that there needed to be alliances within the liberal order, especially of sister republics, ourselves and the Western democracies. But he's also an internationalist. So he was for open trade. He was for uh, breaking down trade barriers. He was for good relations with other democracies. He was for establishing centers of power elsewhere not having all these, inst these other nations being dependent upon the United States. And so he was a realist and an internationalist. He put those together, and I think you have a conservative internationalist. And that's what we really need to focus on today. You bring up another very interesting point in that we are today, sitting here in 2018, the 70th anniversary of the passage of the European Recovery Program Act that brings to life the, uh, the Marshall Plan. Um, we are in some ways seeing the end of those 70 years of that international order that General Marshall was so at the center of, both as Chief of Staff of the Army uh, and as obviously as Secretary of State. What would you say, Dr. Hine, looking ahead, we've just talked a little bit about the present, looking ahead, how might what Marshall did and how he did it influence the way the world moves ahead, and especially the United States, in that, in that new, new world order? Well, I would say we misunderstand the Marshall Plan if we think of it as just a, a massive uh, $130 billion, or in terms of GDP, it would be 1.1% of GDP back then. If it were 1.1% of American GDP today, it would be $800 billion. So if we think in terms of just throwing $800 billion at a country or a region that's in trouble, that's struggling, we'd be making a huge mistake. But I think if we look at the underlying structure of the Marshall Plan, having to do with uh, putting out there and really speaking for and enabling democracy and, and human rights and also free enterprise. I think we forget sometimes how much the Marshall Plan was a structural reform in which we were trying to enable these countries that were, that were really thinking about going to socialism or even communism with a very state-controlled, command-controlled economy, how much the Marshall Plan really pushed them in all kinds of agreements all the way down the line to give free enterprise a real chance, give the market economy a chance. And that's, those two things, I think, are what the United States has not had at the forefront of its consciousness in the past few years, the positive features of democracy, but within situations that are within the United States national strategic interest, not just going around pushing democracy on recalcitrant states everywhere, and also the value, the significance of democratic capitalism. There, there are still no systems in the world, I think, that are better than either democracy or democratic capitalism, and the two go together in terms of the basic freedoms of human beings. Yeah, absolutely, and, and Marshall himself, um, in accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 1953, in his acceptance address, spoke to the, the, those very things, that he understood the role of democracy and economic freedom in terms of uh, a reciprocal relationship. So that's an absolutely very important point. Um, Dr. Hine, we sit here with uh, the four volumes of the famous Forrest Pogue biography of George C. Marshall between us. If you had to suggest to our viewers what other good works on Marshall may be, what might they be? Well, these are very valuable. But as a, and you're an excellent scholar, and so you know that scholars work in terms of levels. So at the first level, there are primary works. And fortunately, the papers of George C. Marshall, published by the George C. Marshall Foundation, are wonderful. And I think that what a lot of viewers might not know is that these are not just letters and documents. It really tells a full history, because the editors have done such a good job of putting these, these documents into context. You can actually read it with pleasure from page to page and get a lot out of it. So I always start with the papers of George C. Marshall. And then I often check a good, solid one-volume biography. And from my point of view, the volumes by Ed Cray and Mark Stoller have not been replaced. I think that someone might come along someday and write a good one volume biography. I'm not the person, but those are excellent one volume biographies. And then the need is at the next level to put Marshall in the context of others that were working on similar problems. So for example, in World War II, 
Marshall and his generals, or Roosevelt and Marshall. And then when you get to the Marshall Plan, the latest book by uh, Ben Steele is just excellent on the Marshall Plan. And then I think in terms of the whole situation of Western Europe and Europe in the post-war period, the struggle for Europe um, by Will Hitchcock is outstanding. So I would recommend all those books. Excellent. Right. Uh, additional recommendations for works that support and add detail to this, this time period and this, this subject? Well, yes. In relation to my lecture on the Marshall Plan Defending Democracy, I would recommend a couple books that have come out just in the past few years. And one of them is by Professor Henry Now, George Washington University, called Conservative Internationalism. And that was published by Princeton University Press in 2013. And the other one is a book by a fellow named Paul Miller. And it's called American Power and Liberal Order, which brings together exactly the two themes that are important to emphasize realism, defending American interests, but also liberal order, expanding the liberal order, because democracies tend not to fight one another. So the more that we can expand the realm of democracies with the same principles and values, in other words, not just defend our interests, but also project our ideals, the better off we'll be as a country. So it's in the American national security interest. You can see the full video presentation of Dr. Hines' Marshall Legacy Series lecture, The Marshall Plan Defending Democracy, on our website. Dr. Hine, you're obviously familiar with Marshall, familiar with what he did, you're familiar with the Marshall Foundation. Speaking to our audience out there across this country, indeed across the world, why might people come to the George C. Marshall Foundation here in Lexington, Virginia? Well, I see this institution as the center, the magnet, for anyone who has any interest in this important figure, George C. Marshall. And I think of it uh, from the time you enter the front door, you encounter Marshall through the artifacts of the museum. And there you have artifacts from his own life and important career. Then you come back into the library where you can engage with the actual words, the actual texts of George C. Marshall. Then you can attend a legacy series event in which scholars really try to shake up ordinary perceptions and try to do some new, fresh thinking on George C. Marshall. Then you can, if you're an undergraduate, participate in the Marshall Foundation Scholars Program. And that tries to engage the rising generations, 18-year-olds, you know, 22-year-olds, whatever, to really do original research and to find out who George C. Marshall was and what his connections were to World War II, to the Cold War. And that really gets them engaged. And then even beyond that, through the media and through reaching out, doing the Legacy Series in other cities, in Washington and so on, the George C. Marshall Foundation reaches out and brings the legacy of George C. Marshall to the wider public. Professor David Hine, that was a very full answer. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being part of this Marshall moment. Please check on our website for future Marshall moments. Visit us at www.georgecmarshallfoundation.org and plan to attend the Marshall Legacy Series lecture either here in Lexington or coming soon in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you for joining us today.